Hello, everybody, and welcome to another session of Dental Shadowing. Today, we are joined by prosthodontist Dr. Jackson. She's awesome. She's going to give us a great session today. So, doctor, you can go ahead and take it away. Hi, guys. Thanks to all who is joining, joining us this evening. Um, let's go ahead and jump right into it. I'm going to start with a little bit of, of background about myself and my journey. So... Everything started off back in the state of Illinois, in the city of Chicago. That's where I grew up, where I was born. Um, you may uh, know this familiar photo here. Um, I like to remember this photo because I don't like the cold. Um, and that's why I ended up where I am today, which you'll find out if you don't already know. So things for me, um, dental wise, started back in high school actually learned about an internship when I was a, a senior um, at this, this really nice office downtown um, where this doctor really pretty much, you know, did Hollywood smiles and just the whole nine. And it was just an amazing experience. Um, that was uh, Dr. Dr. Weller, who I worked for. Um, and I looked him up recently and he still has a five-star uh, Google review, which is amazing. Um, and so he was the, the first person to really put into my mind um, how I can put my passions for science and art together. And so ever since high school, I had my mindset on going to dental school. That then brought me to Bradley University. Um, that's where I went to undergrad. It's a really small liberal arts college, um, about a couple of hours south of Chicago. And, um, I had a great experience. Um, however, I didn't have a pre-dental program and I had no clue how to get into dental school. I just knew I wanted to. Um, I, I just, I didn't have the support that I guess maybe a lot of students in larger schools have these days, but I knew I, I just had to kind of figure things out. And so after finishing up my undergrad degree, I decided I needed some more training um, and also more guidance to get me to dental school. So I did a post back program. I did that at Dominican University. Uh, that is in the suburb of Chicago. I had it um, in my mind that I didn't want to do more than a one year program. So that was awesome. Um, and it really helped me gain my confidence uh, before applying, but also just get access to resources that I didn't have in undergrad. Um, and one of those resources was um, me learning about a program in Michigan where I spent the summer, which is why you see the flip-flop because Michigan is pretty cold. Um, I spent the summer um, seven weeks doing a program called Profile for Success. This program was amazing because part of it was, um, you know, guidance to get you into dental school, but also help you prepare and uh, prepare for the DAT. Okay, and so after that, left Michigan, came back home to Chicago. And um, at that point, my gap year started. And I took the DAT and I applied to dental school um, on a wing and a prayer, but they only have legs. So I just left that there. But um, luckily I got into multiple schools and I decided on UNC, Chapel Hill. And so that's where I spent four years of dental school, um, this was me uh, starting out, uh, which is kind of maybe how you guys will be, but then eventually they'll let you graduate, which I did and I finished. So it was a, a really nice time. And I'll tell you more about that experience here soon. So after dental school, I decided I wanted to specialize in prosthodontics. Um, there were several reasons why I chose a specialty. Um, we'll get into that later as well. And so moving on, I stayed in good old Carolina three more years to finish residency. Um, this was my residency group, a uh, group of really talented individuals, just amazing people, uh, and uh, just a wonderful experience all around. Um, and so it brings me, oh, we, we have a little bit, this was nearing the end of residency. Um, things were getting tough there. 
Uh, and then I did graduate. So that's me there. Mm -hmm. And so then I, I put on my, my walking boots and, and came on down to Texas, the good old warm state uh, where everything they say is bigger. <laughs> um, and that's where I have been since 2019 working at an implant center. Okay. All right. So that's a little bit of the journey. Now, um, I know a lot of you guys want to know about how you kind of go about this process and thinking about things. And so I'll just you know, share with you my, my thoughts and um, in, the, in the process. So um, for me, when applying to dental school, uh, most important was the culture, the culture of the institution you're going to be at. You're going to invest a lot of money. You're going to spend a lot of time, right, the next um, three or four years there. And you want to make sure it's a, it's a culture that kind of says we support you um, and that makes you feel warm and welcome. Um, I think it really does have a large impact on basically your experience in anywhere, anything that you do. Um, and so that was something that was really big for me. Um, reputation was also important. Uh, you, want to, you want to go somewhere that you know based on history, you're going to get a good experience um, learning um, and, and have certain, you know, opportunities available to you because of the reputation. Um, bang for your buck. That was also really important to me. Um, and, and with that, specifically, the ability to, to gain in-state tuition, because that significantly will cost, um, if that's important to you and if you're open to, you know, going anywhere um, or, or essentially different places if you have a wide range. So that's important. Um, resources and support. Resources, meaning, um, you know, access to digital technology. That's important to me. That's where things are going. Um, all schools don't have that. Support, by the way, of say if, you know, you have an emergency or a tragedy that happens while you're in school, is the support in place to, to to be able to help you get through that time um, and, and you know, maintain you know, your seat in the class. Uh, they're just kind of things to think about. Um, diversity of experiences and opportunities. It's also like huge for me. I wanted to know, you know how soon am I gonna be getting into the clinic and seeing patients? Um, what is my patient experience gonna be like? Am I gonna have to find my own patients or is there a plethora patients that will provide me a wide range of experiences uh, clinic wise. Um, do I have the access to digital technologies, like I mentioned before? Um, and is there opportunity for research and outreach? Um, in addition, with the diversity of experiences, it, it was important for me to know that I had as much access to the specialties as possible. Every school does not have a specialty program. It, Every school doesn't have all the specialties. So that's another thing you, you think you might be interested um, is to, to look into that when you're applying. So these are all the things I thought about. Uh, and then lastly, location. I think I was pretty open. Um, and out of all of these things, location was the least important to me. And so, you know, if, this, if there were schools that, you know, were a ridiculous amount of money, maybe I crossed those off, um, you know, if they didn't have, you know, a wide range of experiences that I might have available, you know, so I had a, a very limited uh, number of schools I applied to um, because of those are the things that were important to me. Okay, moving on. at some point in time. Okay, so, th so there may be a lag. I don't wanna jump ahead of myself and then the next thing we're at the last slide. So maybe if we have a question on this slide, while the computer catches up, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Next, please next.
Okay, we got some movement here. Any, no questions? Okay, these are just a few pictures here. Okay, there we go. Um, so, okay, next, um, a little bit more about my experience. So the, the approach I took, uh-oh, I'm gonna go through this again. The approach I took to um, dental school, once I got in, that's what the next slide is gonna show. Um, I like to call it the investment approach, you know? And so that means I'm paying money to, to, you know, become a dentist and this is my dream. Uh, I want the most for my money. And with that comes a beginner's mindset, meaning that I approach everything as if I know nothing and I just want to soak it all in. And so I kind of like to think of it like, um, kind of like a, a, an appetizer sampler or, you know, a tapas dish or maybe even a buffet, which I think those have closed down. But, you know, meaning that you don't know if you like it and so you try it. And so that was my approach. So um, one of the first things I got involved in was research. Um, I worked for the, the oral facial clinic and I also um, spent some time in the second half of my dental school career working with um, a resident and ended up getting a, a paper published, which was awesome as a dental student. Um, so that's something that I got involved in in dental school. Um, outside of research, I also was involved in a lot of clinical experiences um, or outreach experiences. And I apologize for the, the, the lag here. There we go. Okay, uh, we went ahead. Okay, so um, one of the first big outreach projects I was involved with was the Malawi project. And so uh, that's when we spent three weeks of our summer in Malawi, Africa, where we provided dental care to a ton of people um, in communities, um, orphanages, prisons, and um, traveled all across this rural and then they, there was a main hospital there. Um, we were there for three weeks and then we went to Cape Town for a week and that was our fun week. And this is where you can see, I went shark cage diving with, uh, with uh, the other group of three girls. And so we had some really interesting experiences, fun ones, but also just really, um, you know, growth development experiences with regards to the treatment we were providing. Um, an amazing opportunity that I think you know, every school doesn't have to offer. So that was something also important to me. I wanted to have, you know, be able to do that. Um, that was one experience. Um, I also got involved with um, a trip to Winslow. And so that was on one of our rotations where we spent about four weeks um, on a rotation in the summer and I decided to go to Arizona. Um, I was on a Navajo reservation and another amazing experience, got to travel um, did some really nice trips um, um, in the mountains and um, Utah, and it was a really wonderful experience. Um, I also took advantage of a pediatric rotation that was offered to us in Cherokee, North Carolina, and um, spent a week there. We went uh, whitewater rafting, um, another really just great experience. Um, the only thing I really didn't enjoy was the, uh, the camping. Uh, the night that we did camp uh, while I was in Arizona was like a nightmare. Um, but outside of that, the marshmallows were great. Uh, probably wouldn't do that again, but uh, just, just really good experiences. I'll say that. Um, I also uh, took advantage of working in a lot of our affiliated clinics and you know, spending some time um, giving back. That was really, really awesome. I also was an, an Albert Schweitzer Fellow. Um, I had another partner and um, that was an amazing opportunity where uh, you get supported to basically um, kind of touch on an underserved community that has an unmet health need. And so what was really cool is we came up with this project where we decided to create educational courses 
for older people, uh, people above 50. And it, basically it was a series of classes. If they came to a certain, other, a certain number of classes, we would pair them with some dentists locally who would provide them with free care. And this was after dental school. So after a long day of dental school, we we're tired at five, six o'clock. We'd had to drive across town to go and talk to this group of people for an hour. And honestly, like it, it was the highlight of my day and I would look forward to it even though it was extra work and I didn't have to do it. It was just a, a really, really wonderful, wonderful experience. Um, I also took part in um, what we called the Tar Heel Tooth Fairy um, group um, and it was at the, the cancer hospital. There's a, a children's cancer hospital. And so we would visit and talk with um, cancer uh, children and their parents about the, the effects on oral health, provide them with instructions, um, care and tools. That was another, another great experience. Um, outside of that, we have some extra activities that I, I took part in. Uh, we started an acapella group called The Singulums while I was there. We even had some studio time. That was a lot of fun. We sang at a ton of different places. Um, and also other organizations. Um, I was a member of several organizations um, as well as on, on the board for a few as well. So just took advantage of everything. And so, um, yeah, again, if you know, there's sometimes there, there's some, if you take this approach, there's some things that you, you might not ever want to taste again, but you won't know unless you try it. And so I kind of like dipped my toes in, in every, everywhere I could. Um, and I think it really helped me a lot. So getting to my specialty, prosthodontics. Prosthodontics is the dental specialty of replacing missing teeth and or structures of the head and neck. Um, and so commonly, what does that mean? That looks like veneers, especially everyone's talking about that. Crowns and bridges, dentures, implants, prosthetics, um, those type of things. And why did I decide to, to, to specialize in prosthodontics specifically? Well, well, number one was the impact on quality of life. You can really, I mean, change a person's life with the care that we provide. Um, and I hear it every day in and out. Um, it's truly life-changing and there's no better feeling than, than helping someone in, in that, in such a large capacity, even if it's something minor. That you, that you think you might be doing. Um, interdisciplinary care. I love that part. That means teamwork. And so I get to work with orthodontists and oral surgeons um, and uh, periodontists and plan care for a patient collectively and, and be able to, to see the outcome, you know, with all of our hands in, in the mix is, is also just awesome. Um, because you also learn a lot that way too. Uh, craft, craftsmanship, so prosthodontics is a specialty that's known for a lot of hands-on um, with respect to fabrication or actually making of the prosthetic, whether it's the crowns or veneers, dentures, whether or not um, a prosthodontist choose to, to fabricate their own prostheses um, or restorations is up to them, but um, the training involves knowledge um, on how nice, specifically how everything is done. And so that part was also very, very attractive to me. Um, because, you know, if you know how it's done, then you know, you know exactly how it's done, you know how, how it should be done. And, and, you, and so um, it allows you to be able to also troubleshoot and, and even direct your lab when you know the process and understand the process. Creativity, that's probably my favorite part um, with prosthodontics. You can make up stuff and, and it's so much fun um, because there's like uh, five different ways to do one thing and you might make up a sixth way. And so that part is, is really fun and cool and yeah, it's, it's one of my favorite parts. Um, problem solving, that is another fantastic um, kind of uh, part of prosthodontics. It's, you're kind of given this puzzle uh, because a, a lot of these patients 
you know, outside of the straightforward ones, uh, you know, they have complex needs and having, uh, trying to understand all of the moving parts, I think is fun, but it's also challenging, um, which I like. And um, it's just, it's nice because you kind of, again, you, you it's involved with the creativity. You can, you can decide to go one way or another way and then you can look back at your outcomes and, and kind of evaluate, well, you know, which way do I like better? Um, and so the mental, mental approach uh, is also very, very attractive to me when I was thinking about prosthodontics. Um, the long-term relationships that you can build with your patients, it's unlike, um, you know, all other specialties. There are some specialties where it's kind of a one and done, you know, um, and, and you don't really see the person back regularly. And so I liked that aspect that that would be maintained within the specialty um, of prosthodontics that I can follow up with my patients and see how they're doing and their families are doing and what's new and uh, maintaining that connection is really, really nice. Lastly, avoid litigation. And I, I say this because it always just reminds me of the real answer is when you're a practitioner and you learn how to treat patients, you wanna help everybody. You really do. You wanna give your soul to everybody, but you can't do that if you don't know what you're doing. And so knowing myself, I knew I would probably try to help people that I wasn't prepared to help. You know, I didn't have enough training. And so prosthodontics is, is the specialty that really is comprehensive in your training, uh, gives you the understanding of even a lot of different specialties in order to have the, comp the confidence and the competence to treat almost anybody. So I thought that would be awesome. And I would feel a lot better about myself. So uh, those are the main reasons uh, why and um, what it is exactly that we do. Moving on. So how do you become a prosthodontist? Uh, of course, you gotta get into dental school. So uh, you have to do three to four years of college. There are some dental schools that accept uh, students that haven't earned necessarily a bachelor's, but have you know completed certain credits. Um, and then you can get into dental school. As far as I know, there's still only one three-year program. Um, the rest are, are, are four. You finish that and then you apply to um, a three-year prosthodontic program. These programs, um, depending on the program, it could be a master's program and also a certificate or some programs are just certificate programs. Um, these programs are mostly within dental schools. There are some, however, that are affiliated with uh, your VA hospitals. And so it just really depends on the, the specific type of experience you're looking for. Every, every you know, program is different. And so once you, you have a specialty in mind, um, you really want to kind of dive deeper as to, to what experiences they offer and what it is you're looking for. Um, as a prosthodontist, you can take different routes, several different routes. Uh, you can go into private practice for yourself or partner with someone else. You can partner with an, another specialist or a group of specialists. Uh, you could go into corporate practice um, or you can go into institutional practice as either an educator as at a dental school. You can work at a, at a hospital. Um, you can work in a prison. Um, things like that. So there's a lot of different routes you can take um, within specialties that a lot of people I think aren't aware of. It's not just kind of a, a one deal thing where you just kind of do one thing. So uh, there's some flexibility there. All right. Uh, this is my residency life. So, you know, I, I just threw some pictures in here, uh, but residency was really fun, but it's also really challenging. You can see go a little cuckoo sometimes. Um, I did get some really good experiences. I got to present um, a few times in residency, uh, once in, in front of a really large group, um, did a lot of traveling uh, to a lot of different um, meetings, which was really nice because it connects you with people all over the country. Um, we spent a lot of time in the place, on the, the photo on the lower left, uh, that's our lab. And so that's kind of like the place where we used to live, like, you know, live like 
be there until like 10 o'clock every night, sometimes midnight, come back the next morning at seven. And so that was like our second home. Um, and actually only one, one, one night I did spend a night there and it wasn't a good morning at all. But, um, you know, you take the good and the bad, you know, it was the struggle, but it was so worth it. And I would do it all over again and in another lifetime, not this one though. But it, it was great, no, no regrets. Uh, let's see, some common procedures and terminology that you'll see within Prostodoc. So basically what I do, this is what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Consultations, um, impressions, take impressions, final impressions, initial impressions, uh, smile designs, do bite adjustments, we do exams, there are repairs that need to be done that we evaluate. Um, we do a procedure called conversions, which I'll show you a little bit more about here shortly. And we do smile reveals. So it's a wide, wide range of things that are happening um, all throughout the day, back and forth. Um, and um, I really like the, the office that I work in. It is super fast paced, um, which keeps you on your toes and awake because uh, I like to stay awake. And, and so I just, I like that type of environment. And so it's, it's, it's been really, really great for me so far out of residency. Um, I really tried to take some time to, to put this in there, just but I didn't have time to kind of like, you know, flow it in. So you guys are just gonna have to bear with me here. But okay, this is a day in my shoes and I have big shoes, but, but not in like the figurative sense, but I wear size 10 ever since the sixth grade and I hated it. But um, these are some new comfy shoes I got. They're, they're by Adidas and they're really comfortable. And so we're gonna follow my big shoes. So our morning huddle starts at 7 a.m. So that's where we get everybody amped up and ready to go. And like, woo, we're ready to do it. We do a team, woo, let's do it. And we go over all the patients. You know, if there's gonna be some TLC patients, you know, give them a little extra attention and care. You know, um, if there's some times where, you know, there might be, you know, some patients waiting because it's kind of packed in there. How are we gonna manage that? Um, we just kind of game plan. So. It's, it's, uh, it's the, what we get, you know, we get the excitement for the day and we game plan um, and it, it's like sets the tone for the day. So it's, it's just a great um, energy and vibe to have um, specifically when you have a work in a place with good culture, you know, where everyone is supportive and everybody wants to help um, the patient. So we do that at 7.30. After that, um, and this is just examples and it's no one specific order, but kind of just to give you an idea, um, we might have our first consult show up. First consultation might be a patient um, who knows exactly what treatment they, they want, they're excited about it, and they're ready to start, okay? Um, and so uh, after they kind of get a tour of the place, they, they get a 3D scan, and um, they share their story with us, and then that's when we connect and you know give them a treatment plan and a recommendation. and. Um, after that, I might be called in to do a bone check for the surgeries that are happening that day. Bone check, uh, meaning that uh, for, for the conversions that I'll tell you about shortly, um, you know, we have to check to make sure that there's a certain amount of space for the prosthetic or the teeth part. Um, so we, you know, we give our surgeons thumbs up, like this looks great, okay, on to the next step, they place the implants. Um, I might do Leave after the bone check, I might go do a bite adjustment for a patient who's already has their, their teeth in place. Um, and then come back maybe shortly and do the abutment check. The abutment check is, is the, the basically the middleman piece that holds the teeth to the implants that are in bone. Okay. Um, after that, um, I might do another consult, probably, probably do another consultation, maybe see another patient who's kind of in, in mid-treatment um, for some type of procedure. Um, but then after that, uh, I might do my conversion pr procedure. The conversion is essentially, um, if you think about implants being placed in the bone, it's when you attach the teeth. So that way you have, instead of a denture that comes in and out, you have something fixed in place. And so that's a really important pr process because you kind of have to get that right. Because um, if you don't, then the patient leaves with a crooked smile like this. That's not fun. So um, that's actually a really, really exciting. I have a kind of like a sweating face there because it's like really exciting and fun. 
but it's also like, okay, we got to get this right. Um, also with, with those patients, they're usually coming out of uh, their sedation. So they're kind of like sleepy and some of them are groggy. Some of them might, you know, you need their cooperation because they have to be able to open and close that. Um, so it's definitely a, a fast paced uh, type of procedure. Um, after that, I might do some troubleshooting. So say maybe we have uh, a new set of teeth that are in and one of, and there's there's someone having a hard time maybe getting it fitted correctly. And so that's where we say, okay, what went wrong in the process um, and then how do we correct it? And so we might do some investigating there. Um, after that, I might do a process uh, exam uh, for a patient that's getting ready to have their procedure done. And so that's where we do our smile design and so the patient, we, we select the shape, the size of the teeth, the shade. Um, the patient is super excited to come back to have the procedure done. Um, and that's a really fun, a really fun appointment. Um, after that, I might have literally like a couple, like couple bites of lunch. And then somebody's calling me to come somewhere else. Uh, I might do an exam or two, make sure things are looking good, look, evaluate it next. I'll come back and have a couple more bites. And then there's another consult. And maybe this consult, this patient is crying, you know, uh, maybe, maybe it's a consult where it's a husband and wife and the, you know, the, the wife is crying because she hasn't kissed her husband in 20 years and they just want to be intimate. Uh, but he has to take care of what's going on at, and, you know, his oral health. And so that'd be one that's like super emotional, um, but, you know, always leaving the patient with hope and excitement for the future that yes, you came to the right place. We can help you. Um, it's also a, a good feeling even after hearing those really sad stories. Um, I, after that, I might go back and do my last little bite of lunch and uh, maybe go to another consult or um, you know, go back and do some, see some more patients in the clinic that are kind of already again in their treatment. Um, and, and maybe, you know, this is infrequent, we try to keep it infrequent, it might be some conflict resolution type of situation where we have a patient who's upset for some reason, you know, that things aren't right or things are, you know, about the experience and you have to de-escalate. Now, this is a really important skill uh, in a, that, you know, everyone should have uh, in, in their bag of tools. And um, I think I've kind of gotten that down um, and uh, yeah, yeah, it's kind of one where you just have to you say, I'm here to help you and I need you to help me help you. And, and then usually it all works out. Um, so that's, that's putting out fires there. And then uh, towards the end, let's see what we have. Is that, uh, can't see the, okay. So the smile reveals. So the smile reveals are usually towards the end of the day. And so that's the patient's. We were having surgery that day. So the, the, the patients that I did the bone check for and the abutment check and did the conversion or the attachment of the teeth to the implants um, at the smile reveal, now after the, the lab has finished everything up and made it look beautiful, we come and attach the teeth so that the patient uh, can smile to leave with. And so those are really, really fun to, um, you know, to see the patient. Maybe the patient that I just talked about, you know, like, the couple who was crying about being sad because they couldn't be intimate. And, you know, maybe a couple of weeks later, they're here for their smile reveal and now they're crying because they, you know, they can't believe what they see. And so um, it's really just, uh, I don't know, just, just, I just love it. And so then at the end of the day, we do a, a huddle wrap up and we say, well, what did we do well today? You know, what, maybe what can we do better tomorrow? Okay. Everyone, let's go home and rest up and let's do it again. And so that's what the day um, in my shoes looks like. And it says 5 p.m. or later. I mean, it could be 6, it could be 7 sometimes. It just depends, you know. Um, but that's what the day looks like. Uh, okay, I have a couple cases. So um, this first one, this is a, kind of like the conversion case. So um, up top we have, I'm sorry, it's not in, in great order, but I'm going to try my best to walk you through. I start at the bottom. So this is, this is the same patient, by the way. Um, the bottom, is, it shows basically the upper jaw of a patient who already has been indentulated, no teeth. Patient um, has insufficient bone thickness for the placement of, of dental implants. And so that's where some pre-grafting, um, pre-prosthetic 
the surgery was was done to, to bulk up the bone so that now we have enough thickness for implants to be placed in the jaw. Um, up top, top left, is the dentures um, that the patient is in initially, meaning that they have to take them in and out at night to go to sleep. Um, this patient is a patient that doesn't want to have to take teeth in and out anymore. They just want to be fixed in place, like, like our teeth that you know, God gave us. They grow in fixed in place. They don't come in and out. And so that's where we can kind of combine or incorporate uh, dental technology. technology where we have what's called a cone beam um, x-ray or a CT. And so if you notice uh, the, the dentures, they have these little blue, little bead sticker like things on them. Patient then goes, get a, goes and gets an x-ray and they show up on the x-ray. And so now that we have this reference to the tooth patient incorporated, incorporated with the x-ray, we can um, do precise measurements um, from the teeth where we might place the implants. And it's very predictable. So, so from there, we can create a surgical guide, which is the next photo you see where the green teeth. And it has the holes exactly where the implants are going to go related to the bone because we have, again, those, those bead mark references. So it's really cool how you can um, kind of map things out and create predictable outcomes for your patients. Um, so a little closer look at this actual conversion procedure or the guided surgery, or actually the guided surgery. So, um, so now that we have um, a surgical guide that we created off the x-ray that you guys saw, now we can actually take that, that was made on a, a, a mill, uh, was milled out on a machine. We can see the patient's mouth. We have the holes for the plans of where the implants are gonna go. We do all of that there. Um, there's some, grafted that might need to be done depending on changes in the bone and whatnot, um, but the implants go in. Things heal up very nicely, and now we have implants in the bone and we attach um, the, the middleman piece to the implants in the bone. Those kind of pegs that are coming up is now what gets attached to the teeth. And so now we have the teeth that are fixed in place um, with the screws little tiny small screws that go in between the holes and the patient leaves with those same teeth now, um, now in place and, and, no, and no more having to take them out at night. No more denture glue, stuff like that. Um, it really does increase a, a patient's quality of life uh, significantly. They eat better, they can oftentimes talk better, they can taste their food because their palate isn't covered up by the denture prosthetic uh, and um, you know, most patients uh, who have success, they always say they wish they would have done it sooner. So it's a really great uh, tool to have as a clinician. Second case, this one is quite different. So I, I mentioned that as a prosthodontist, we do do prosthetics. We, we, we fabricate prosthetics. You can um, if you, you have the training, um, but I had the fortune of, of treating this patient in residency um, he presented actually in our sleep clinic. Um, he has sleep apnea and the chief complaint was that uh, with his appliance, his CPAP, all the air that was supposed to be going in to keep him oxygen it was escaping through his eye. The eye socket that he had removed due to lacrimal duct cancer or cancer of the tear duct. Um, so this patient, he didn't have a history of smoking or anything, uh, kind of like some bad luck with cancer. And so um, the, the, our, the person or the, the head of the clinic, um, of the sleep clinic, who's also a prosthodontist, said, hey, well, you know, have you ever thought about getting a prosthetic eye? And he said, oh, well, I didn't, I didn't know that I was a candidate for that. And so that's when he got um, the patient connected with me and, um, the anaplastologist that we work with who does oral facial uh, prosthetics. And so uh, we evaluated the defect and uh, determined that yes, we were a candidate, we can make you a silicone prosthetic. Um, and this, this man was so sweet. He had been wearing a patch over his eye for eight years because he didn't know that he could get an artificial eye. And um, the first thing he said to me, he said, 
can you see my inner thoughts? And so he had a wonderful personality, so sweet, and uh, just was a pleasure to work with. So um, what you can see here is some, some measurements or some marks were made on his, on the defected eye. Um, and this is a close up of what things look like, okay? Then the next thing we do is we make an impression. And so what we, the plan is to do is to basically replicate um, his, his natural normal eye on his left and basically mirror that in the prosthetic. So we first capture that. Um, after capturing that, uh, we then take some measurements of that eye. We kind of uh, basically select a color of an artificial iris that's very close to his natural color eye. Um, that impression that we make now is turned into a cast. That, that's what this white cast is. And so now that we have the cast, um, there's a process where we can actually duplicate and, and mirror in wax uh, kind of the replica of his natural eye um, with placing the eyeball first and then the iris and then placing the lid and contours and wax. Now this, this wax uh, kind of mock-up can be altered um, after we kind of get the general you know, design or, or um, kind of anatomy there. Then that's when we go and try to work it in to make it look more real. So after that, we get um, basically the silicone prototype that then gets hand painted and stained on the day that we deliver it uh, to the patient. And the patient now has, doesn't have to wear a patch. He can have actually closure of the eye to where he can effectively treat his sleep apnea, um, which is gonna leave him in a place of better health, but also give him a better quality of life. Um, and so after that, we recommended that he get some um, newer glasses, um, maybe with a heavier frame, so that way things look really undetectable. Um, and, it, and it really looked amazing. I, I wish I could show you guys the final photo. Um, maybe I might be able to do that if we do another session, but this was an amazing case that I worked on and um, had the opportunity to do so. So prosthodontics, um, there's a lot of avenues. Uh, this particular case is reserved for the, the kind of the subspecialty of maxillofacial, maxillofacial prosthodontics. However, my program, um, we, we ran a, what's called a maxillofacial clinic once a week. So we kind of got a, a mini uh, fellowship within this subspecialty um, through my program, which is not an offered in an all prosthodontic program. So that was a, definitely a plus uh, from my experience standpoint. Um, yeah. So I only had two for you guys, I'm sorry. Um, but we're moving on to advice. I don't even know how I'm doing on time. I hope I didn't run out of time. Oh, okay, perfect. So advice. So uh, I would say first, you know, for people that are, are applying, you want to seek mentors. Um, and not just, you know, someone that you'll ask maybe one time for some advice. Mentors that you really make a create a relationship with. Because I think where a lot of people, applicants miss out is on the opportunity to re request really good letters of recommendation for people who really know and support you. And so that means seeking people, mentors, they don't even have to be dentists. Some can be dentists, some can be family, friends, but people who you know genuinely support you and like you uh, and, and want to see you succeed. Um, you know, not just someone who you, you know, know of, you know, like, yeah, I know them, but they don't really know you. And so that makes a difference. Um, and so I think as an applicant, it's really the small details like this uh, that overall will make a difference between an acceptance and a denial. The second a, a piece of advice is to get more experience. I think, and, and it's hard these days, which is why we are online right now, but as much as you can, you wanna actually get into the action and see what's going on day to day. Um, it's gonna benefit you um, mostly by you know, basically confirming whether or not you, that you really want to do this. This is a huge commitment. And so um, another failure on a, some people's faults that actually go into dental school, they don't, they don't get enough experience knowing what they're getting into. And so sometimes expectations aren't met and that's where that can lead to regret. And, you know, nobody wants to feel that way. You want to be proud and, and be, be confident in, in your decisions to make an investment like this. Um, Third, oh, oh no, with, with the get more experience, get more diverse experience. Don't just go to the same old place. 
uh, the whole time. You know, seek out different opportunities. You know, maybe try to get into a hospital if you can to shadow or just, I mean, different specialties. Try to, to see as much as you can before you even get into dental school. It only helps you more. Um, then you want to visit these schools and programs that you're interested in. Um, again, this is just my, my perspective, but I think culture uh, in an institution is super important to your success and to your happiness over the, those next four years. And, and that's something that really can't be communicated. It's something that you feel. So you have to go there and say, hmm, does it feel cold in here? Like, or, or these people are really nice. Like, I feel like I'll be supported and, and you know, they'll be there for me, you know, if I need some extra help. Like I, I can not only see the protocols are, that are in place for that support, but I can feel it. Um, and so I would really suggest that, um, especially now that things are opening back up, you know, you know, do what you can. Um, other advice. So you want to know your why. This is super important because, you know, if you don't know why you're doing anything, you know, you're not really going to be successful successful in it, or you're going to be, uh, your expectations are just not going to be met because, you know, you haven't identified, you know, why, you know, you want to do this. So for example, you know, is your reason because your mom and dad did it or your dad and your uncles did it and it's just what the family does. And that's not a good reason, you know? Um, so, so kind of like dig deeper and just, just think a little bit more on, on really why, why are you motivated to, to get into professional school? Um, identifying that is going to help help you get through the tough days because you get to remind yourself, not reminding myself, well, dad did it. That's not a good reminder. That's not going to make me go back. <laughs> me, at least, I don't know about you guys, but um, outside of that, you want to be open to explore. And that kind of goes back to what I was saying in the beginning of like trying everything. Um, you know, I think even for me, like, you want to basically, in some instances, kind of not force yourself, but be open to trying things that you normally probably would be like immediately turned off to, um, or you know, maybe not so like excited to do, or maybe you just have a little interest in it because it, it might um, allow you to explore parts of yourself that you didn't know were there. And so it, that's also a really, really nice experience to have personally um, from a growth perspective and professionally and, and personally. Um, the third one, this one is really good. You want to invite feedback. And I mean, not welcome, uh, not, you know, uh, you know, except, no, you want to invite feedback. Meaning like, I, I would really like your feedback. Uh, you have to approach people. Uh, you know, you have to, I value your, your feedback. You, would you mind taking a look at this? Would you mind read, reading over my personal statement? You want to get as, many, as much feedback from, from people that you look up to, you admire, um, and respect, right? Not from, not from everybody, but from those type of people. Um, and I mean, of course you have to take things with a grain of salt, but when you take that approach of um, requesting specific feedback from those type of people, you increase the quality of the feedback you get that's gonna be helpful to you. And that's in any aspect of life. Um, but especially, you know, getting into dental school, while you're in dental school, um, invite feedback. Uh, you know, it, it can be uncomfortable. Much the, the, the faster or the sooner you become used to getting that feedback and use it as a tool for your, your development and growth, um, the faster you're gonna get to your goals. I guarantee you. Uh, and then the last thing is to enjoy the journey. That means the ups and the downs, all of it, um, because then that's really like, that's what makes the whole experience worth it. Um, not just, you know, oh, I hated it. But you don't want to say you absolutely hated it. Yeah, of course, it was hard and it sucks sometimes. But, you know, overall, you know, I mean, I wouldn't trade it, you know. So you want to be able to look back and say that. So thank you. Any questions? Yeah, so we have some questions in the chat for you. The first question was, how many of each procedure did you do in dental school? Crowns, fillings, root 
has implants extractions? Um, uh, a lot. So, and more than one. So there's some schools where you're only required to do maybe a one or two or some, some things. Um, I think the more experience that you have, the more confidence you have. Um, and I think, but I also think more, it's kind of, it's kind of hard, but of course, the more experience, the more confidence you can have. I think the sooner you can get into dental school, I mean, I'm sorry, to, to into the clinic while in dental school, the better. There's some schools that's kind of late and they kind of cram it all into then and it's kind of hard. Um, so that's definitely gonna be better to look at. But um, as, as far as my program at UNC, the requirements were pretty, uh, what's the word? Uh, I won't say they were a lot, but they were like substantial. Um, it was a good number to be able to feel confident and to be prepared to take your board exams. Did you have to pass those? And then another question here was, how many patients on average do you see in a day? So I would say like, like 20 to 30, maybe 15 on full day. And then another question here was, how did you go about choosing a specialty or were you always interested in prosthodontics? Um, so I did shadow prosthodontic, uh, prosthodontist and, and kind of work intern for a prosthodontist before dental school. So I was aware of the specialty. However, I didn't go into it knowing I wanted to do it. Um, I explored all the specialties. I even mentioned I went on that pediatric rotation because I love the kiddos. Um, but for me, prosthodontics was my, my top choice for those reasons that I mentioned, all those other, re all the reasons there. Um, and it didn't mean that I didn't explore interest in the other, the other uh, specialties. It's just that was the one that um, I identified most with. And then another question, why did you end up choosing um, UNC as your dental school of choice? So I actually uh, committed to Maryland's dental school. I had to UNC at the very last minute. Um, it was at that time they were doing interviews um, as late as January. They had a January interview, which they no longer have, but that uh, that's the interview I went on. And this was after a friend me to apply. And I said, I don't know anything about North Carolina. I was like, that sounds like a really country place. You know, it was ignorant, but I didn't know, you know, it was in the South. I didn't know anybody down there. And so she was like, no, you should really, you know, you should try it out. You know, it's nice. You can be my roommate. So I applied and um, even at the last minute, you know, that school, they only accept 20% out of state students. And so, and then that's what I mean about the details matter because, you know, for me to apply last minute and still get a seat of the 20%, um, you know, you, you have to present yourself well. And so, you know, I guess the advice I left out of there is don't wait till the last minute to do your application. Don't wait till the last minute to, to start uh, hounded people to give you a letter of recommendation at the last minute. You know, start early, um, even with your personal statement. Start early um, to where you can come back, you can write something, come back in, in a month or two, come back and look at it again. Um, I think that's, that's where the best applicants turn out, the ones that start early. Um, and, I, I, and to just kind of solidify that thought is, you know, I, I think I, I would prefer someone to apply later with a much better quality uh, application than to be the first one to apply with crappy application because they rushed it. And so that's kind of where the quality really does and the time and the effort put into it makes a difference. So what happened was I, I committed to Maryland early on, like December 1 when I got in. I went to visit and it was nice, but I, just, I don't know. I went to visit again. And I don't know, but something just, I don't know, it wasn't like, I wasn't feeling right, you know? And it could have just been me, I don't know. Um, and then I went on the interview, I went ahead and applied to UNC, went to the interview, and then I, it felt warm. It was just so warm. And I was like, well, I like this feeling, you know? But I was like, I paid my $700 to Maryland. Do I want to give that up? And I was so, at the time I was working at a restaurant and at a spa and I was at the restaurant one night 
and there was a game of Maryland versus UNC in the bar. And I said, whoever wins this game, that's where I'm going to go. And so that's how I decided on UNC, ultimately. But they also didn't say tuition. That was also heavy. It's like, I need to save a little money, too. And it felt warm there, and I could have a roommate. And, and it was all kind of feeling right. And, and, and I have no regrets. Um, another question here was, how did you prepare for the DAT? So I remember that program, the Profile for Success program at Michigan, amazing. I still have friends from that program to this day. They paid the cap the cap course. That's the only course. I did the Kaplan course. And then when I got back home to Chicago, I studied for two weeks and I took the exam once and did well. So, um, and, and I'm not a traditional amazing test taker. That was sufficient for me, just, just that one course. Um, but there's a lot of materials out there that will work. I think my best advice on that, don't drag it out. Study for maybe, you know, four to eight weeks, no, no longer than that, and just knock it out. And then a shout out here. Someone says, hey, Dr. Jackson, it's Kayla. I was dental assisting student and worked with you in grad pros back in 2017 to 2018. I just wanted to thank you for your advice back then as I'm a D1 at ECU now. Oh my gosh, hey, Kayla. That's awesome. I would love to hear that. And so with that, please feel free to reach out. I've actually talked to several pre-dents um, over these last few months, at least like 10 or so. I, I would love to give you specific feedback or you know, help or just talk um, through your thoughts. Um, just reach out and send me an email. We can talk. Oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> and then another question was, hi, Dr. Jackson, as far as you're aware, are they're all pros, or I think they're asking, is all prosthodontic residencies three years? I feel like there might be a couple based in the VA hospitals that are maybe two years, but most are three, yeah, that I know of. Okay, and then another question was, what would you say has been your most emotional case? You said em emotional? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hmm. I don't know. I cried so much. <laughs> um, hmm. Oh, man. Um, well, I mean, I've lost patients. That's tough. Um, there's patients, you know, that I have treated that had had cancer or facial cancer and it's coming back. Or even I had a patient with, all, with Alzheimer's that had a very steep decline. And, um, you know, I couldn't even finish their case. And, and so I think that's the part that I also do like about prosthodontics, not that it's sad and depressing, but that, um, I don't know, you, like you get to feel your work, you know? And you know, some of it is really sad, but a lot of it is really like nice. Um, so one specific case, I don't know that I can think of one off the top right now. I'm sure there is one, but I've also treated a whole lot of people. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, I think the, the ones that are, the cases that like are, you would think are the saddest, usually those people are like the brightest, which like makes treating them like even better. And then another question here was, how did you pay for dental school? Woo. Well, I'm hoping uh, the government takes over the rest of that. Uh, but I, I, I use uh, the, the credit line of, of the government uh, through student loans. Yeah, and it's still worth another, it. <laughs> and then another question here. Um, what would you say to somebody who is, you know, thinking that they're going to backtrack their life because going to dental school and residency is a long ways, um, that they're gonna miss out on what life has to bring socially, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I thought it earlier today, you know, I don't think any of us like, as little kids and say, oh, what do you wanna do when you grow up? I wanna go to school for 12 years. No, and then be so-and-so. And so, 
I mean, because like, like that's why I say when you enjoy the process, then the years, they don't even matter because it's fun and you're growing. And um, I think, I can't remember, someone told me this, you know, like whether you're debating on this, well, but you know, it's gonna take five years. In five years, you're still gonna be the same, but without that degree. So you might as well have the degree. I mean, I don't think, I don't think I've missed, I mean, I've, I don't think I've missed out on anything. I think, uh, yeah, there's of course a little delayed gratification. So have enjoyed myself thoroughly. And then our last question for you is, what is your favorite procedure to perform? Hmm. Uh, I think like the conversion is really fun because it, uh, or, or the smile, like it's kind of the, the, the smile reveal, you know, like, so, so basically all of the big steps on, on the same day smiles, I, that's, that's a whole lot of fun. Um, I'm not doing a lot of surgical procedures now, but that's also a lot of fun. But basically the, the full mouth transformation cases, uh, those are the best. Awesome. All right, that's going to go ahead and conclude our session with Dr. Jackson. Thank you so much, Dr. Jackson, for coming. Thank you.